I'm Indy Nidell, and this is Out of the Trenches, where I sit here in my chair of wisdom and answer all your questions about the First World War. And you can now ask those questions at our official Out of the Trenches website, which is outofthetrenches.thegreatwar.tv. Uh, Jeffrey Smith asks, Hello, Indy. I was hoping you could answer a question that I've been wanting to ask since 2016. You have stated that the use of poison gas was banned by The Hague, but the German army seemed very quick to use it early in the war. I was wondering if this was widely supported by the military leaders, or even the Kaiser himself, or if the use of gas was very controversial in the German command. Keep up the great work. Well, the use of poison gas in January 1915 at Bolimov by the Germans was quickly condemned by the Entente powers, claiming it to be an obvious violation of the Hague Treaty. The Germans argued that the treaty only banned the firing of chemical shells. This meant that using gas projectors, allowing the deadly gas to be carried by the wind, was not technically a war crime, at least not in the eyes of the Germans. Of course, once the Germans had used it, the floodgates were open, so to speak, and the Allies didn't take long to start using it themselves, despite heavily criticizing the Germans for using it in their war propaganda. In fact, though many people believe it was the Germans who first used chemical weapons, this is not true. They were the first to use a deadly gas, yes, but the French were actually the first to use chemical weapons, using tear gas grenades already in August 1914, though with almost no effect, as the gas wasn't even detected by the Germans. In truth, there was some hesitancy and disagreement over the use of chemical weapons among the German high command. However, after it was used to devastating effect on April 22nd, 1915, most of these doubts came to an end. Now, this doesn't mean that everybody was happy with its usage. For example, in a letter written by Major Karl von Singler, he describes chlorine gas as very effective before going on to say, this is a horrible weapon. Steamboat Willie asks, I know that Billy Bishop and Hermann Goering survived the war while Georges Guinemer, Manfred von Richthofen and Max Immelmann did not. Did any other of the well-known flying aces survive? And could you please tell us which was the top surviving ace of the war? Sure. Um, uh, American flying ace Eddie Rickenbacker survived the war, uh, claiming 26 aerial victories in the short time the U.S. were involved in the conflict. Uh, this set the American record. Australian fighter pilot Arthur Henry Cobby, known as Harry, uh, he also managed to survive the war. Despite being in active service for under a year, he claimed 29 victories, ranking him third behind Roderick Stanley Dallas and Robert Alexander Little, who both died in 1918. Um, Godwin von Brumowski uh, was Austria-Hungary's leading fighter ace, being officially credited with 35 air victories and a further eight unconfirmed as they fell behind Allied lines. He lived to the ripe old age of 46, dying in a plane crash in 1936, instructing an Austrian student in the Netherlands. The highest scoring German fighter pilot to survive the war was Ernst Udet. He was second only to Richthofen as a German ace. He scored 62 confirmed victories and would go on to be the Director General of Equipment for the Luftwaffe during the Second World War. However, this role would prove to be too much for Udet, as after trying to warn Hitler about the dangers of engaging Russia in the war, he suffered a mental breakdown, which was further exacerbated by his drug dependency, which was orchestrated by fellow fighter pilot Hermann Goering. This eventually led to Udet taking his own life in 1941. Padre Leahy writes, I've heard about Sir Roger Casement's attempts to form an Irish battalion in the German army out of Irish POWs. Do we have any information on it? Did they fight in any battles? How are they treated post-war? Sound, love the show. I like that, sound, love the show. Nice ending. Um, and we've talked about Casement in the regular episodes, sure. Uh, Sir Roger Casement did indeed attempt to recruit an Irish brigade from more than 2,000 Irish POWs that were captured early on in the war. After successfully negotiating a declaration by Germany, which essentially stated that should the Germans ever land on the shores of Ireland, it would not be as an invading force, but as an ally to Irish nationalists. Casement then signed an agreement in Berlin in December 1914, which allowed him to recruit these POWs. However, 
Only 52 of them volunteered for the brigade, and they received no machine gun training, despite what the Germans promised. The reason so few men volunteered was likely because they knew if Britain won the war, then the act of volunteering for this Irish brigade would be punishable by the death penalty for being traitors. Casement's plan was unsuccessful. In April 1916, Germany also offered the Irish 20,000 Moisen Nagant 1891 rifles, 10 machine guns and ammunition, but no German officers. Uh, for Casement, this was a disappointment, as he'd hoped for many more guns and some military expertise. The guns never made it to Ireland, as the ship carrying them was intercepted by the Royal Navy. Casement himself was captured days before the Easter Uprising. Uh, his trial, though, was not straightforward, not for the prosecution, since his crimes had been carried out in Germany, and the Treason Act of 1351 seemed to only apply to activities carried out on British soil. However, the court decided that a comma should exist in the unpunctuated original Norman French text, which changed the meaning enough to allow Casement's prosecution. Casement himself wrote he was to be hanged on a comma. He was hanged at Pentonville Prison on August 3rd, 1916. Cody Bain asks, could breweries in Europe operate during the food shortage? The grain used to make beer is also used to make bread. While the citizenry of countries at war, with the citizenry of countries at war starving, how could they justify brewing? Was beer no longer produced, or did the price of beer increase and the amount of food decrease? What happened to Oktoberfest? The beer situation during the First World War differed from country to country. Um, in 1915, in Britain, the then Chancellor of the Exchequer, soon to be Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, gave a speech in Bangor, North Wales. In this speech, he proclaimed that drink is doing us more damage in the war than all the German submarines put together. That was clearly hyperbolic, though Lloyd George was referring to the lure of drink, as he put it, and its effects on workmen in armament factories, where he claimed efficiency was significantly lessened by the desire to have a pint or two. This led to the establishment of the Central Control Board, the CCB, which was to regulate alcohol trade. The CCB significantly reduced the opening hours of pubs and breweries across Britain to just five and a half hours a day. The prices of pints doubled since beer was heavily taxed, and it became illegal to buy a whole round. Uh, King George V, inspired by Lloyd George's speech, pledged to remain sober for the duration of the war and urged other noblemen to do the same. However, as far as I'm aware, only the Duke of Portland actually responded to this call to sobriety. On the front, however, men were treated to and treated with rum. Rum was administered for everything from, from shell shock to Spanish flu and was given as a daily ration for men in the trenches. When the men went over the top, most commanders issued them with a double ration, despite the fact that medical research had already proven even then that it reduced shooting accuracy. And that's not surprising though, given how potent army rum was at the time. Some of it was as strong as 80%. In theory, drunkenness in the trenches was punishable by death. In practice, most officers up to the rank of general turned a blind eye to it as getting drunk was part of the recovery process for returning to the trenches. Uh, the beer situation in the German army was a bit more complex given the regional nature of its units. Like uh, units from Bavaria were much more likely to be given beer as part of their daily ration. However, as you say in your question, there was indeed a food shortage in Germany thanks to the British naval blockade, which put a strain on the alcohol industry and led to shortages in alcohol. Most soldiers received one of the following in their rations half a liter of beer, a quarter of a liter of wine, or 125 milliliters of schnapps. German soldier and author Arnold Zweig claimed that it was possible to fight a war without women, without ammunition, even without strong points, but not without tobacco, and not at all without alcohol. But as the war dragged on, things like potatoes and barley were needed for food much more than for alcohol, so that the men's rations of booze became few and far between. Uh, Oktoberfest, which you asked about, was cancelled during the First World War, as well as in some other wars. Uh, unlike in Germany, French breweries actually increased production of beer during the war to cope with the demand of the British. Um, most breweries did water down their beers, which was an act approved by officers as it would reduce drunkenness. 
A lot of alcohol selling establishments also popped up behind the front lines during the war, and there was even one in a tunnel beneath enemy lines. These establishments sometimes included swanky, officers only cocktail and champagne bars. True story. Speaking of Billy Bishop, if you'd like to see our special episode about him, you can click right here for that. And do not forget to like us on Facebook, and do not forget to follow us on Twitter. See you next time.